cheers to you. Welcome to Spark TV. I'm very excited to have you on the show. Thank you. I know I have another little sip. Yes, that's right. We'll get ourselves get ourselves prepared. Love it. Love it. And I love that we're both in WA. That's fun for the afternoon. So close yet so far. I know. I know. Oh, so good. So let's start out just by telling everybody who you are and what you do. Sure. So I am Renee Tapley. I am an interior designer by trade. I've been working in sort of both interiors and architecture for over 20 years. Um, And through my practice, um, I have become really obsessed and, um, you know, fine, finely tuned into sustainability and um, green building particularly. And hence why I've started to um, look at developing my passion project, which is Future Materials, um, which is a startup I've been working on for around four years now. Um, And it is Future Materials is going to be a place where interior designers, architects, home renovators and construction professionals can come to find truly green materials and products for the construction Mm. industry, Um, which is something I've found is really difficult to find in my day job. And there's a lot of greenwashing and kind of mystery around a lot of the products and where they come from and the story behind them. And so Future Materials, yeah, really seeks to demystify and um, make it a lot easier for people to access these products much faster, which is what is really needed. Yeah. That is amazing because I'm kind of guessing that if it is hard for you as a professional... It is yeah. hard for everybody else who oh, perhaps okay. wants to do the right thing. Yeah, it is so difficult. You know, it's a minefield out there, really. Um, and I, you know, we have, as design professionals, we have a lot of inside info and insights into what we should be looking for and what the criteria is around that. But if you're mm. a home renovator, you know, you, it's really difficult. You have no idea coming yeah. in completely fresh. So, um, yeah, so I felt... After working in many practices, I worked in London for years and then came home and was in Sydney working for a large architecture practice there for many years and now um, now working in more boutique interiors uh, across all of that range of experience and we're looking at different sectors, hospitality, commercial, residential as well. It's something that is needed across all of it. So mm-hmm. it's, uh, yeah, it, it's def- there's definitely a market need for it. Um, and also this is driven by an absolute obligation I feel and a responsibility I feel to not be complicit in the construction industry's carbon statistics anymore, which is, um, which I will be for some time, but, you know, future materials will still help to temper this in the meantime. It currently contributes to 25% of Australia's greenhouse gas emissions, which is huge. That's crazy. Like when you talked about, I'm thinking uh, oil and gas is the problem, you know, mining is the problem. That's really interesting. I don't think I've ever heard anybody talk about that. See, this is the problem. It is such a huge problem. It's absurd, absolutely insane. And of that that 25% I mentioned, I mean, and that is 39% globally as well. So Australia is like a little bit less. So globally, it's a mass, even more of an issue. But of the the percentage for Australia, it's um, broken up currently into the sort of the carbon and energy it takes to operate buildings. So air conditioning, Mm. lighting, the operational carbon costs. And then the other portion of it is about materials manufacturing, um, which is where future materials really starts to come into focus and to draw attention to this point of um, only we're only going to showcase low carbon and circular materials. Um, so that we're not, you know, contributing to this issue, uh, as much as what we have traditionally with traditional materials, such as concrete and steel and, and a lot of other, um, materials and products that are really normal and the status mm-hmm. quo, um, still in building today. Yeah. Well, as I'm just listening to you talk about it, I'm kind of guessing that changing this industry like Mm. so people who have been building for so many years who just do things the way they do things use suppliers they've always used Mm. actually moving the needle I'm assuming is a huge feat massive yeah and I've come up against a lot of you know a lot of pushback you're right the contractors and the tradies like they have a particular way of doing things. And of course, over years, they've built up their own expertise and mm. tried and tested ways. Um, however, given we all need to start 
converting and sort of turning our minds towards the green economy, that it does require huge amounts of shifts and changes. And for everyone, you know, in my practice, in in everyone, in in our in, even in our homes, like how we recycle and the types of products we'll be buying in future. And for the contractors, it's no different. So there will be, you know, there's always going to be some resistance to that in the beginning, mm. but I see it as a, a long game plan and there are going to be some difficult transition years. And I feel like we're stuck in them right now, to be honest, you know, in the, in the world's transition to net zero, which is mm. a problem we are, you know, in these early transition years right now, it's kind of like treading water. You sort of feel like you're making gains, but like it's really slow. And <laughs> A little pushback, and but, there's a little bit of drowning yeah. in between there. Yeah. Can I get out? Of that? But you know, little by little, we will get there. I'm sure of it. And then we will come to our kind of aha, you know, eureka moment where we can make gains then in leaps and bounds, like much faster than we are now. I just think it's yeah, it's going to take a few more years of these kind of hard, hard years to get there. Um, and in saying that, though, we I am finding more willing partners over the last few years mm -hmm. you know we do have more of a receptive audience now um when I first started to talk about this it was like if I was talking to a foreign language it was you know one was really yeah I mean it, there weren't a lot of like-minded uh whether it was tradies or, or or professionals around me but now there are a lot more there's a canvassing of a movement and it feels mm -hmm. like we are gaining momentum and traction in it um, yeah, and it's sort of also backed by some really great institutions and organisations who are really leading the charge with it. Mm. And I guess there's so many stakeholders. So, you know, we kind of mm. said, you know, tradies, you know, suppliers, I guess there's also got to be consumer demand. So you kind of got to marry up all of these puzzle pieces and just slowly find the people that care now while you're, you know, building until it kind of gets that point where there are enough people that are willing to, you know, pay the money or willing to do what it takes to go so far as to research and find out what is out there that is actually more sustainable, renewable, whatever their interest exactly. might be. That is the that is the the critical issue that Future Materials seeks to streamline and make easier, mm. um, and kind of eradicate really, because we have to demonstrate demand in order for these products to thrive, you know, and to sustain yeah. a, a local supply chain. Because that's another thing, as as the sort of um, out of these COVID era years the local supply chain has been drawn into focus as well because we can't rely solely on it on imports um, mm. into the future it won't be possible so we do need to sustain a local thriving you know industry of circular and low carbon materials currently yeah. that's starting to you know have a little bit of uptake and and definitely some funding which is great but there needs to be a whole lot more of that and in order to to make that a you know to make that a viable business case for anyone in business mm. or in government we need to demonstrate demand and future materials will enable that to happen because we'll be able to track, you know, how many people are interested in whichever products and get really specific and fine grain on that detail. So we can take that, you know, data to the stakeholders. And um, also I'm really lucky to have been awarded a Churchill Fellowship this year. Congratulations. <laughs> oh my God. That's awesome. Yeah, through the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust. Um, and I'll be taking, it's a travel scholarship and it's uh, for research purposes. And so my research kind of hypothesis or, or subject is about um, looking at what is happening elsewhere abroad, especially in Europe, wow. um, in terms of green materials, innovation and manufacturing and studying it, going to, you know, meet many, many different suppliers and um, stakeholders and seeing how they've been able to thrive and have successful products that have been brought to market. And, to, and I'll take that information back home and I'll, I'll write a report um, on the findings. Mm. And then, you know, that will be disseminated throughout the industry to show ways in which we can fast track this and make it a whole lot easier. And also, really normalize it you know I, I really would love the day where I don't have to keep talking about all of this and the changes that are needed um and it actually becomes our new normal you yeah know? it's yeah 
Well, so good when you can demonstrate to to people that it's been done before, Mm -hmm. you know, this isn't a new concept. Other people are thinking this way, achieving great things, you know, Mm -hmm. selling it into customers, whatever it might be, when you can actually take that and show, you know, industry in Australia that Mm -hmm. it's, that it's doable. I'm sure that's going to help your cause. Yes, exactly. It will. Yeah. Mm. And it's uh, it's absolutely needed as a kind of a body of research work here as well, which was what the, I guess, you know, why I was successful and the, the trust could see that, that it was mm. a, um, something that no one had really explored before in, in terms of the fellows before. So, yeah, so that's going to be amazing. That's what was that process February like? How did you February find month. out about that, apply for it, win it? What was that all about? Oh, well, so a friend of mine had said to me last year, you've got to apply for this. <laughs> and I, I had, I was aware of it. I'd heard of like, you know, Churchill Fellows and the Fellowship before, but I hadn't really looked into it in much detail. And my friend sent me it, but then I was too late to apply last year. So, um, oh, sorry, I'm talking about 2022 and not, not 2023. <laughs> That's... It, we're already got to love a new year to just throw oh, us out. <laughs> yeah, the year before last. Yes. Um. Anyway, I missed the cutoff for 2022's fellows, and I uh, made sure I was like I could apply in good time for last year in 2023, which is what I did, and I did actually spend quite a lot of time on the application and took great care mm. uh, in making sure I had the time to really, you know, get the application working really well. Um, and yeah, and so it was wonderful. So I'm so, so cool. um, thankful and grateful to have been awarded it because it is a beautiful organization. They, you really feel like you're part of a family. Oh, <laughs> um, wow. They've been so warm and welcoming and just such a incredible endeavor that they set out for themselves where, you know, it doesn't really matter what your background is or what you're into, but if you mm. can convince them that you have a case, to, you know, a specific subject area that you're interested in and and this research is needed to to shore up what we're doing here, mm. then, yeah, it's you can go for it. So I encourage anyone who's <laughs> who has been looking at it at all or, you know, doesn't even know anything about it to go and, um, go and look at it and also apply. That's so good. I love it. So will the platform be like a marketplace? Will, uh, you know, anyone be able to log on and look for something? Will you be able to buy things? How do you see it operating? Yeah. So it will be staged and there'll be kind of, um, you know, revisions and evolutions of the phasing of the site. I Mm. obviously, I don't have um, all of the funds right now to be able to do it all, although I would love to. Um, but realistically, it does need to be staged. So the first um, the first go live launch will be a selection of around 50 to 75-ish products um, that will be freely accessible to everyone. Um, and they will be from recycled aluminium panels um, that are endlessly recyclable to like recycled plastic, beautiful um, terrazzo like products that you know yeah. you can use in kitchens and and um, also for furniture um, there's a lot of beautiful products that are Australian made as well um, from recycled glass like a a substitution for all of the um, engineered stones that are coming under a bit of strife oh, yeah. from the silicosis yeah. that is happening through yeah. the fabrication process like Caesar stone and the other reconstituted stones there's an Australian company who are doing um, working on a basically a substitution for that which is made Mm -hmm. of recycled glass which is beautiful and all of these things are really design led like they're they're beautiful Mm. and so the other thing with future materials is changing the stigma of what has traditionally been attached to you know a sustainable product or material yes like yeah a bit daggy not quite (laughs) you know not sort of a bit cottage industry or crafty um this is absolutely not so Oh my God. It's so hilarious that you say this. So I've just started using a natural skincare product Mm. and you know what I hate about it? It doesn't look pretty. (laughs) And I'm like, why don't people that like care about the ingredients care about great design? (laughs) Yes. Yes. It should follow. I feel like the two go hand in hand, right? Like, and also, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah so I guess it's it's and and through I've been researching this for 
seven years or so now. It started when I was working in London, um, my interest in these materials. And I had access to a really kind of fertile market there of mm. fantastic new products that were being launched um, and could sort of kind of um, expedite or, or, or come to market quite quickly. Um, and that was through different, different, you know, channels that they had available to them. And, and that's something else I'll be touching on through my fellowship research is how that can actually happen faster here in Australia. Um, but yeah, and so then when I moved home, I realized I, I started working for a practice here and, you know, rested on my laurels of all my material database contacts <laughs> <laughs> and realized it was crickets. Absolutely wow. nothing um, was out there. And this was in 2018. So so I realized that, you know, it, it, it needed to move as fast as we could. And also it's almost like Google. You just need access to this good information freely, you know, and yeah. it's, it, it just needs to be brought out into the light of day so that everyone can see it. And um, you can therefore make gains environmentally much mm. faster. I think people want to do better, yeah. but it's too hard. Mm. You it know, is. when you think about um, eating healthily, and you've been at work all day. The last thing you want to do is come home and cook a healthy meal, you know? Yeah. And it's it's like people want to make good choices in all of their lives. And I yeah. believe that people are good at heart and do want to care about the environment. But if we make it hard for people, it just becomes too hard. And we put that into future us problems. Yeah. And unfortunately, the future's here. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's right. I know. Mm. I absolutely agree. Um, and, you know, I've found it hard being in, inside the industry searching. Yeah. And so you can only imagine how difficult it is for everyone. So, yeah, so, you know, it's a very kind of open, democratic, demystifying, no design, mm. like, the, like weird jargon or lingo. <laughs> it's like for everyone. And it's also the best, the sort of cherry picked, most beautiful, best, truly green, verified products that are available now. Um, and yes, to get back to your earlier question, it will become a marketplace in future. Um, mm -hmm. and that is in built into the, um, the plan, the future plan. Um, but initially it will be about generating interest and gaining momentum and, you know, getting eyes on it as much as possible with a really good selection of the kind of, you know, crip of the, uh, the, the pick of the crop. <laughs> oh. Um, and yes. And so yeah, I've got great, I've got a lot of plans in how it could evolve and, and add more functionality and tools in future. Um, and also later on, I mean, I, I see it becoming um, a series of physical materials library spaces as well, um, mm -hmm. where people can actually come into the space and pick up samples, have a look at everything in person, ask questions um, and have, we can host events and workshops there as well. Mm. That's so cool. I love that. How do you find straddling work, <laughs> like <laughs> career, and building this? Because I know how intense both can be. How have you yeah. found that? Well, to be honest with you, I feel like I have I lead a double life. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love somehow it. managed to cram in two jobs into a working week, but um. I am slightly a bit of a crazy person in that regard. But anyway, I feel like I just need to have a few years of pain for long-term mm -hmm. gain. And that's been my motto for the last few years. I'm hoping that will somehow end soon. There'll be a moment in time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Where's that arc? Yes. It's like, uh, um, but yes. Uh, so I guess what I do is I, I'm absolutely committed to my my day job and I love it. I love what I do. I have a fantastic team and I'm supported by one of my oldest, dearest friends who I'm working with at the moment at Full Scap Studio. It's a boutique interiors practice um, based in Melbourne and I set up the Sydney studio for Full Scap and now I've come back to Perth full circle, a long time coming um, and have set up Full Scap here as well. Um, and so really I... I guess worlds collide a little bit though as well, like um, at Full Scap and, and our work, we are committed to all of these things at the mm. same time and materials research is a huge part of what we do. So anything I find it kind of feeds into our projects and vice versa. Um, and then in addition, I, you know, just, I, I literally do about two to three hours every night as well. So that's wow. where the extra 
comes in. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting. I love, I do love that because I, I always advocate to people not to just quit their day job and, you know, dive into things. I love that a day job can complement your business. Yeah. It can give you the financing. It can give you the support. It can give you the networks. It's sort of, I know sometimes I think people romanticize the, you know, burn your bridges kind of mm-hmm. approach to business, but I really believe that it's just, we're all humans. It's all an ecosystem. There's networks. Yeah. You just never know who you work with that, you know, will support your business down the track and it's just all interconnected. So I'm a huge I, advocate for that. I couldn't agree more. I am absolutely, yeah, uh, on board with all of that. And that's really been the way I've operated you know, in living memory, I wouldn't say my mm. whole life because I don't can't quite remember how I was <laughs> as a child. But, um, but yes, absolutely. And I feel, you know, it, it can, you can get it working for yourself in the best possible way where it works for everyone. You know, like mm. I've been really open and transparent with um, everyone I'm working with and my dear um, director Adele and. You know, actually, it's if it's the if it's a good idea and it it feels right for you know for the general community, then of course mm. like, it's only going to be positive for everyone. And um, yeah, and and for us, like for instance, Full Scat was uh, able to support Future Materials last year. We had a beautiful event as part of Open House Melbourne in the studio. Oh, in cool! Yeah, yeah, and we opened up the studio to feel like a open materials library type day where um the passers-by could come in and explore the materials which was all the future materials showcase so I had oh, all wow. of the samples and products that I'm going to be showcasing on the site laid out on a really beautiful curated um communal table and we had a panel discussion um with some really great in you know industry heavyweights there to talk about um what they're doing and how they're impacting the industry and I chaired that discussion and yeah, there was around 300 people who came through throughout the day. So it was fantastic. And so that was all supported by, yeah, um, Full Scout we're working with at the moment, which That's is great. That's so cool. And such a great um, awareness piece as well, right? And building your community, you yeah. know, before you completely take the leap. I think that's genius. Yeah, it was good. It, it was, and it was also um, like a good sense check actually on the types of customers who will mm. be coming to Future Materials. You know, we had home renovators who had a lot of questions and were there so inquisitive and and there for hours and you know looking at everything like it was this foreign like alien type thing. <laughs> And um, then we had design professionals who are more like very directed to the things that they like caught their eye and they're like, oh, I could use that. Mm. And then we had some of the product suppliers there all day as well, like our dear <laughs> legendary suppliers. And one uh, is a Welshman who's hilarious. And he, yeah, he was there answering all the questions all day. <laughs> and I made sure I had some Guinnesses for him at the end of the day. <laughs> Um, but you know, it was great to have them there as well because they could just provide some really technical and detailed information. And yeah, anyway, we had a great cross section as well as some students, um, and some educators from universities and they were super, super into it. Yeah, it is really interesting. I always think about that, you know, you've probably touched on two things, you know, community building for one, but Mm. also that, you know, who will be your customer which is really important to what are their problems, who is really interested in this space, who will be the catalyst that's going to kind of probably propel it forward more than maybe somebody else in the in yes. the industry or customer type. So being able to host an event or run something online or, you know, build a social community, whatever it is, they're all really important building blocks that you have to do as a business, I think. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I didn't really realise, to be honest, uh, in you know in preparing for the event and, and signing up for it and everything how much amazing impact it would have in terms of like shop, I guess um, validating a lot of the ideas or market research and market segment and customer profile type research I had done for the business yes um, it was a really good kind of litmus test I guess um, you know yeah. where you could really yeah and, and it was it was fabulous and um, I think it was really valuable for that. And I, yeah, in the beginning, I didn't, 
quite realize it would be so valuable. Um, well, sometimes it's that in real life element, right? I feel yeah. like sometimes when we research things for our business, yes. whether it's a new idea or a new marketing strategy or a new whatever, it is theoretical, right? And sometimes it's not until you actually launch the thing or, you know, buy somebody a coffee or pitch mm-hmm. your first idea. Sometimes you just don't know how people are going to react. I know, absolutely. And I find, yeah, I love people. I love that like, interaction. And so I think in person, although we've had many years of Zooming now, <laughs> Yes, my life is on Zoom. I'm really thriving off the in-person meetings and and especially with the product suppliers who are going to be represented. You know, Mm. I I really want to establish really good relationships with them and and know them as, you know, as people and their story and what they stand for. Because part of that is really the verification process of, you know, having them represented on future materials also. You want to know that you're working with good people and that they actually – uh, have integrity in what they're doing yeah. and they stand by what they you know the products or, or whatever the information is around the products that that they stand by those um that criteria as well so yeah so I I do I guess that's why I also wanted to have that future growth plan of future materials becoming that sort of space that can hold like a literal physical space that can hold and host those types of events in future ourselves as as mm-hmm. well as um in launching you know for instance exclusive products or furniture with like some of the suppliers materials um integrated into that um as well as yeah boosting and championing for local manufacturing and makers because we do have there's a whole other conversation here around yeah. you know, just amazing local makers and craftsmen and and yes. women um yes. that uh and we yeah you, we're all you know everyone loves australian made and supporting local businesses but on the design side of things it's really it's a long slog and a hard slog for them so um i want to bring that into the fold of of what we're doing as well and really support and champion and champion australian and uh, new zealand designers um which has, yeah, been even more important um, in these kind of post-COVID years. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and that's it, isn't it? I think there's a lot of people who are, you know, trying to support their families or themselves through their craft. Mm. And it is difficult. Like they are, they are small business owners as well and getting the word out and getting people to understand, you know, and even the value I find with, uh, sometimes with smaller artisans, it is more expensive, but yes. you, but people don't quite understand what's involved in mm. hand making something. And that is why it's so special and why sometimes it attracts a higher price tag. Yeah. Yeah. True. True. And it's about the story of it as well. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I fit and it lasts longer, you know, it's a one-time oh, yeah. purchase. Like there's a lot in terms of, so if we're talking about end of life and recyclability of these products, this is a key criteria for pitch materials. It, the same should, the same sort of lens should be taken for, you know, furniture and homewares and things like that. Like, yes. I remember um, when we were, before we left London, there was a site that was launching and it was called like Buy Me Once or something. Oh, okay. Yeah. Heard of it. Yeah. And they had all of these like lifetime warranty guarantee products where, you know, you buy it once, literally, <laughs> you never have to replace it. I I think the same of furniture and home and other bits and bobs around the house. Um, mm. You know, I think it's better to save to, to get a beautiful, special piece that you know will be with you and it's like collecting your things you know you you oh yeah this is who you are and yeah Hmm. I love that I couldn't agree more I I would much rather spend a little bit more on something that I'll have forever and that I adore as well you know like especially and I find this now that we work from home more your Hmm. space needs to be your space you know you really do need to yeah, it'd be I think a little bit more thoughtful and considered about where it is that you live because we just spend so much time here now. Yeah, we really do. Oh goodness, yeah, the home environment is yeah, and I I obviously work in it, so space really kind of affects me, and I mm. I'm a bit more sensitive maybe to it. But 
your home environment is one of the most important spaces psychologically and and if you have kids especially mm. um, so yeah I think it, it's it's important to kind of be considerate about your choices you know and not okay. and there's so much now again out of the COVID years I just feel like we're just kind of completely saturated in this like it's almost like fast fashion but for homewares you know it's this yeah. like fast like lifestyle concept yes my stores that are proliferating everywhere and you have no idea about the provenance, where anything comes from, where it's made, what it's mm. made. Like there's no real, um, you know, regulatory or any kind of like recourse or or watching over that at all, um, which I find a bit dangerous. Yeah, <laughs> the absolutely. Environment. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, no, I think it's exciting. I think what you're building is completely necessary <laughs> and and exciting I'm I'm really really excited to follow the journey Thanks. so let's leave the fabulous sparks with one last piece of advice I always like to ask this of women in business so if you could reflect on your time building future materials and pass on a piece of advice to another woman in business who is currently walking the path <laughs> what is a piece of advice that you would give that's helped you on your journey hmm. I would say stay the course like if you really believe in this and you're really passionate about something you go with it don't let anyone try to tear it down or even if you come up with the you know quite intense blocks or barriers find a way to work around it and just stay the course because if you do that I feel like you will succeed and you will you know you will be true to what you're you help you'll you know actually um, pay with integrity and you'll follow through on what you're wanting to achieve I find that there's a lot of external influences now not only you know digitally in our social media world but also just like in our own heads and like if you're like me I've really just launched this myself and I've 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 always tried to look for external sounding boards in my friends and family and experts um but it is difficult if you're on your own doing it and I think if you can just yeah just hold on to the integrity you hold of your idea and your passion and just keep that as your driving force um yeah go with it and I wish everyone the biggest success <laughs> I love it that is absolutely beautiful thank you Renee for sharing your journey and wisdom with the spark community um as I said so excited about what you're building and definitely can't wait to have you back on for updates <laughs> thank you so much Danielle lovely to meet you as well